Greetings, malefactors. My name is Sam, and today we're jetting off to the middle of the North Atlantic to learn all about the small yet enthralling land of Iceland, where the descendants of pillaging Vikings will boast to you in perfect English about their low, low crime rates. The tables have officially turned. Iceland has staggering amounts of offer in the way of delicious morsels of factual goodness, which I simply cannot wait to sink my teeth into despite the looming spectre of my horrendously incorrect pronunciations. You've been warned. But why is Iceland so... explodey? What and where is New Iceland? And why does my mum keep going there? She keeps just going there and coming back with, like, random food? I... no idea. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so grab your winter coats, your snow shovels, and your medieval Viking longboats, so we can sail perilously through the knowledge fjords of 101 facts about Iceland. Number one. Iceland is a lovely little Nordic island country located in the North Atlantic, just chilling by itself, minding its own business, sipping on some gin and juice. Iceland's nearest international neighbours are Greenland to the west, the Faroe Islands and Norway to the east, and the UK and Ireland to the southeast. With the Arctic Ocean directly to the north, and the rest is all Atlantic Ocean, baby. Number two. The island that's now Iceland was thrust up above the surface of the Atlantic by a series of massive volcanic eruptions that occurred somewhere between 18 and 15 million years ago, which, geologically speaking, of course, makes Iceland a fairly young island. Since its formation all those millions of years ago, Iceland has been uninhabited by humans until relatively recently. And thus begins the history of Iceland. Hold on, it's going to be a bumpy ride. It's going to be a... A bump? It doesn't matter, forget it. Number three. You may have been surprised to learn that the first people to inhabit the island of Iceland may not have been those crazy Vikings we've all heard about. While the marauding Scandinavians were certainly the founders of the nation of Iceland, it's believed that as early as the 8th century, the island had previously been inhabited by a small number of Irish monks known to the Norse as Papa, who had travelled to the harsh rocky isle in search of isolation and solitude in order to devote themselves more fully to God. Number four. However, when the Norse started rocking up to the island, the Papa decided they didn't fancy hanging around with a bunch of Scandi heathens who had the audacity to worship several gods instead of just the one, which is obviously the correct number. And so these irritable Irish hermits packed up and cleared off, leaving the Norse to get stuck in with setting up Iceland as a genuine bona fide country. Still, it should be noted that much of what's now known about the Papa comes from documents written hundreds of years after the events they describe. So while experts are fairly sure that Iceland's first inhabitants were Irish Christians, maybe not. Just saying. Number five. The very first Scandinavian to set foot on the island now known as Iceland is believed to be the Norse Faroese dude named Nadur, who apparently was just minding his own business on his way back to Norway from the Faroe Islands in 861 when he sailed severely off course, like severely severely. Somehow Nadur ended up bumping into Iceland where he decided to stay over the summer. Number six. After finding no other people on the island, Nador simply got back in his boat and left, but not before naming the island Snayland or Snowland, because it was snowing at the time of his departure. Real creative there, Nador. Good job. Good job, bud. Number seven. At some point in the 860s, the Swedish Viking explorer Gavroros Svavarsson decided it would be a right laugh to sail around Iceland just to make sure it was death an island, and in doing so became the first person to circumnavigate Iceland. He then decided to call the island Gavroros Sholmi after himself, because that's just how Gavroros rolls, baby. Number eight. In 870, another Scandinavian fellow named Flocky Vilgerorsen set out for Iceland despite not really having an exact idea of its location. In order to overcome this predicament, Vilgerorsen brought with him three ravens, which are apparently very good at finding barren islands in the middle of the North Atlantic. News to me. Anyway, when he released the ravens, the first flew towards the Faroe Islands, while the second simply flew up in the air before returning to the boat. The third, however, flew toward Iceland, leading the way for Vilgerorsen and leading him to be nicknamed Hrafna Flocky, or Raven Flocky. Number 9. At some point following his arrival on the island, Vilga Rawson beheld a fjord completely covered with ice in the middle of spring, after which he decided to refer to his temporary home as Iceland. Again, the Vikings weren't particularly creative when it came to naming places, but the title stuck, and there's not really much we can do about it now. Personally, I would have called it Lawrence Land, after the world's most beautiful yet down-to-earth and totally normal and chill celebrity, Jennifer Lawrence. Number 10. While the title of the first permanent inhabitant of Iceland isn't definitively known, it's generally believed that the permanent settlement of Iceland began in the year 874, with the arrival of Norwegian chieftain Ingolf Ronarsson. He was then followed by various other Norwegians and Scandinavians, along with their slaves, known as thralls, who were generally Irish or Scottish. Number 11. By 930, these early Icelanders had decided to get their act together and form the very first Althingi, a legislative and judicial assembly held in the plains of what is now Thingvitlia National Park. This meeting of tribal leaders, known in English as the Althing, essentially constituted the foundation of the Icelandic Commonwealth, thereby making Iceland a legit nation. Muzzles of. Number 12. 
As mentioned, the first Icelanders were filthy pagans who worshipped the Norse gods. But all that began to change when Christian missionaries turned up and set about trying to convert everyone. Though these efforts were initially met with limited success, pressure from Norwegian kings eventually led to a growing Christian population in Iceland, which predictably provoked tension with the resident pagans, sparking fears of a coming civil war. Number 13. Luckily, a war between Iceland's pagans and Christians was averted in the year 1000, when a guy called Thorgeir Thorkelson, great name, was accepted to serve as an arbiter for the conflict. After a day of rest and contemplation, Thorkelson decided that Iceland would adopt Christianity, with the stipulation that private pagan worship would be tolerated. And with that, Iceland became a Christian nation. Number 14. The period between the 1120s and 1230s within Iceland is often referred to as the Great Age of Writing, as it was during this time that most of the Icelandic sagas were written. These narratives mostly concerned historical events that occurred in the previous centuries, especially genealogical and family histories. Examples include Islendingabok, or the Book of Icelanders, written in 1130 by Ari Thorgilsson, as well as Heims Kringla, or the History of the Norwegian Kings, written around 1230 by noted Icelandic historian Snorri Sturluson. Number 15. The Icelandic Commonwealth lasted until the 13th century, when internal conflicts between the various Icelandic chieftains erupted into violence, while Norway continued its campaign to bring Iceland under its control. This volatile period in Icelandic history is known as the Age of the Stirlungs, after one of the island's most powerful family clans. Number 16. This period ended in 1262 with the signing of the Old Covenant, when the Icelanders finally agreed to submit to Norwegian rule in the hope it would bring peace to the country. As such, while the old thing continued to be held, its role became that of a court justice rather than a legislative assembly. Number 17. This period of Norwegian rule lasted until 1397, when Iceland became a region within the Kalmar Union, which united the kingdoms of Norway, Sweden and Denmark, along with various other territories under their control under Danish rule. Kalmar Union sounds like it should be a chart-topping EDM group, but alas was merely a personal union of three Scandinavian countries during the late medieval period. Disappointing. Number 18. While Iceland was spared during the outbreak of the horrific Black Death pandemic that ravaged Europe during the 1340s and 50s, the disease eventually made its way to the island in 1402 with devastating results. Some estimates suggest that as many as two thirds of Icelanders perished, reducing the population to as little as 30,000 people. Number 19. Well, at least they didn't have to go through all that again only 90 years later, eh? <laughs> Psych, that's exactly what happened, when the plague returned for outbreak numero dos in 1494, claiming the lives of as many as half of the Icelandic population. Basically, 15th century Iceland fully sucked, I would not recommend. Number 20. After the breakup of the Kalmar Union in 1523, they didn't even do a second album. Iceland remained under Danish rule as part of the states of Denmark-Norway. A few years later in the 1550s, King Christian III of Denmark began to impose Lutheranism on his subjects as part of the Protestant Reformation, and Lutheranism has remained Iceland's favourite flavour of religion ever since. Number 21. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, Denmark imposed harsh trade restrictions on Iceland, making the already fairly difficult lives of those living in Iceland even difficulter. As if that wasn't bad enough, in 1627, Barbary pirates raided Iceland's coastal settlements and abducted large numbers of people to be sold into slavery. An event known in Iceland as Turkja Anith, meaning the Turkish Raid. Damn, Iceland really annoyed the Norse gods when they all converted to Christianity, didn't they? A non-stop hassle. Number 22, oh oh, Iceland. <laughs> so yeah, it wasn't always fantastic being Icelandic, but luckily I can tell you for sure that Iceland definitely wasn't hit by the plague for a third time. Kinda, because it was hit by a smallpox epidemic in 1707 that killed around a third of the population. Oh, they can't catch a break, these guys. Moving on. Number 23. Things finally started to get better around 1783 when Iceland experienced an economic boom and psych got you again. While there was certainly a boom in Iceland in 1783, it was less an economic and more volcanic boom in nature, as it was the year in which the Lackey volcano in southern Iceland continuously erupted over a period of eight whole months, ejecting roughly 42 billion tonnes of lava. In addition to all that extremely dangerous and destructive molten rock, Lackey also spewed out enormous quantities of hydrofluoric acid and sulphur dioxide, which, if you didn't know already, are super poisonous, you guys. Number 24. These compounds contaminated Iceland's soil, obliterating the vast majority of Iceland's crops and killing roughly half of all livestock, which in turn triggered a famine that claimed the lives of up to 25% of the population. The amount of sulfur dioxide released by the Lackey eruption was so significant that it literally lowered global temperatures, caused crop failures in Europe and droughts in North Africa and India, resulting in even further deaths. The years after the eruption came to be known as Smotherhardendin, or the Mist Hardships. Number 25. 
1814, following the Napoleonic Wars, Denmark-Norway was broken up according to the Treaty of Kiel. And while Norway entered into a union with Sweden, Norway's dependencies of Greenland, the Faroe Islands and Iceland remained in the union with Denmark. Now, instead of being ruled by Norway, who were ruled by Denmark, Iceland's constitutional setup was streamlined, so it was just ruled over by Denmark. Number 26. Throughout the 19th century, Iceland's climate continued to grow colder, prompting mass emigration to the New World to the tune of roughly 15,000 people, over 20% of the country's population of 70,000. A large number of those emigrating from Iceland settled in the region of Gimli, Manitoba in Canada, and as such the area is often referred to as New Iceland. Number 27. Following the restoration of the All Thing to its previous legislative function in 1845, a desire for Icelandic independence began to emerge in the 1850s, inspired by similar movements in mainland Europe and the work of Icelandic intellectuals. The political push for further Icelandic autonomy was led by a fellow named Jón Sigurðsson, and in 1874, five years before Sigurðsson's death, Denmark granted Iceland a constitution and limited home rule, which was further expanded in 1904. Number 28. Not only that, on the 1st of December 1918, an agreement with Denmark known as the Danish-Icelandic Act of Union was signed, recognising Iceland as a fully sovereign and independent state in a personal union with Denmark, with the opportunity to vote on the arrangement 25 years in the future. This made Iceland's legal position somewhat similar to those of countries belonging to the Commonwealth of Nations, like New Zealand or South Africa. Number 29. With the onset of the Second World War, Iceland was left in a vulnerable position, located halfway between Europe and the United States with no army or navy. Uh-oh. Following Germany's invasion of neutral Denmark, Iceland's possessing country, the United Kingdom felt it necessary to occupy Iceland in order to prevent the Germans from doing it themselves, and so, on the 10th of May 1940, in direct violation of Iceland's neutrality, the UK carried out Operation Fork, constituting the British invasion and occupation of Iceland. Not long after that, the UK invited the US to occupy Iceland instead, so that British forces could be used elsewhere. Number 30. On the 31st of December 1943, during Iceland's occupation, the Danish-Icelandic Act of Union expired after 25 years, and several months later, in May of 1944, Icelanders participated in a four-day plebiscite, in which over 95% of the population voted to end the personal union with Denmark, abolish the monarchy, and establish a republic. And so, on the 17th of June 1944, Iceland formally became a republic, with Svein Björnsson as its very first president. After almost 700 years of being ruled over by other nations, Iceland was finally fully independent once more. Number 31. In the 1960s, Iceland expanded ever so slightly with the arrival of, wait for it, a whole new island! Yes, on the 14th of November 1963, huge clouds of dark smoke billowed out of the ocean just south of Iceland's Vestmania archipelago off its southern coast, and within several days a solid island had formed as a result of, you guessed it, volcanic activity. Real original Iceland. Number 32. The eruptions continued until June of 1976, wrong way round, by which time the new landmass covered an area of 2.7 square kilometres. The island, which was dubbed Surtsey after Surta, a fire Jotun or giant from Norse mythology, has since eroded down to a more modest size of around 1.3 square kilometres. Number 33. Between the late 50s and mid 70s, Iceland was engaged in a number of confrontations with the United Kingdom known as the Cod Wars, in which the two nations battled over fishing rights in the North Atlantic. This period saw numerous instances of violence between fishing trawlers and warships, with British military vessels ramming into Icelandic fishing ships, and the Icelandic Coast Guard frequently sabotaging the nets of British trawlers using a specialised net cutter. After threatening to leave NATO, Iceland eventually emerged victorious with a massively expanded exclusive fishery zone, resulting in significant job losses amongst British fishing communities. Number 34. Following the privatisation of its banks at the turn of the millennium, Iceland's banking sector collapsed in 2008 as part of the global financial crisis. Relative to the size of its economy, Iceland's banking collapse was the largest of any country in economic history. While many other nations chose to bail out their banks, Iceland opted to let them fail, then instituted social welfare and debt forgiveness programs for its citizens and convicted corrupt bankers. Only a few years later, the IMF declared that Iceland's economy had recovered without compromising its welfare model. Number 35. Uh, 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 uh. In 2010, the constantly exploding island of Iceland experienced further volcanic eruptions at, oh my lord, Eyjafjallajökull, a stratovolcano covered entirely by one of the country's smaller ice caps. As you probably gathered, volcanic eruptions in Iceland aren't particularly out of the ordinary, and the eruptions themselves weren't particularly large. However, the ash cloud produced by the volcano was chuffing massive, with rock and ash sent up 9 kilometers into the atmosphere, which then spread across almost all of Europe and parts of North America, Asia, and the Atlantic. Number 36. 
Since volcanic ash can cause significant damage to aircraft engines, the AF Latvia Yokotal eruptions caused major disruptions to air travel across pretty much the entire European continent. Roughly 107,000 flights were cancelled as a result, ruining the travel plans of roughly 10 million passengers for weeks after the eruptions in what was the largest air traffic shutdown since the Second World War. Thanks, Iceland. Number 37. Today, Iceland is a highly developed nation economically and democratically, ranks highly in terms of social stability and equality, and in 2018 was ranked as the world's sixth most developed country by the United Nations Human Development Index. While Iceland is not a member of the European Union, it is a member of the European Free Trade Association and the European Economic Area, granting it access to the EU's internal market. Number 38. Politically, Iceland is a unitary parliamentary republic, rated as a full democracy by the Economic Intelligence Unit, so at the very least it has that going for it. In fact, actually, Iceland is ranked as the second most democratic nation on the planet, after its old man Norway. Number 39. Given that Iceland's legislature, the Althing, has existed in some form since the year 930, it's arguably the oldest existing parliamentary system in the world, at well over 1,000 years old. Norway's parliament, known in English as the Storting, isn't even 200 years old right now. Number 40. In 1980, Iceland voted to make Vigdis Finn 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 Vigdis Finn Bogadatir their fourth president, making her the world's first democratically directly elected female president. Serving from the 1st of August 1980 to the 1st of August 1996, a span of exactly 16 years, she also remains the longest serving elected female head of state in any country to date. Number 41. Not only that, on the 1st of February 2009, Johanna Sigurdardottir became Iceland's first female president and the world's first openly gay head of government. Hooray for lesbians! Ah, oh, we've been demonetized. Damn it! The meaning of life. Possibly one of Iceland's most commendable achievements is that it's been ranked the world's most peaceful nation over 10 years in a row. Iceland keeps bagging itself this enviable accolade based on its extremely low crime rates and its relatively low levels of economic equality, which I believe generally leads to less riots, revolutions, and whatnot. Number 43. Iceland is so peaceful, in fact, that many criminals are put on a waiting list for prison because the country doesn't have enough available prison cells. Not only that, if a person waits over five years to be sent to prison, their sentence is voided and they don't have to go. Number 44. Indeed, only one person has been killed by armed police in Iceland since it became an independent republic in 1944, when a 59 year old man from Reykjavik was shot after firing at police in late 2013, later dying in hospital. Number 45. The Icelandic Special Forces, which is the country's elite counter-terrorism unit, is also known as the Viking Asvegtin, which translates to the Viking Squad. Number 46. Iceland's military consists almost entirely of the Icelandic Coast Guard, and is the only NATO country that does not maintain a standing army. Iceland's regular police officers do not carry guns as there is very little crime in Iceland, and violent crime is practically non-existent. Number 47. Still in conflict with its peaceful reputation, Iceland was involved in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. The world's most peaceful nation sent a grand total of two soldiers who were explosive ordnance disposal soldiers. Number 48. Iceland also boasts considerable credentials as one of the world's most environmentally friendly nations, with roughly 85% of the country's energy consumption coming from renewable sources. Nice. Phew. Iceland's electricity supply specifically is produced almost entirely from renewable energy sources, with around 70% coming from hydropower and the remaining 30% coming from geothermal power. Number 49. Around 98% of Icelanders are connected to the internet, the most of any country on earth. So you Icelanders have no excuse not to watch this video and share it with your Icelandic buddies. Share it. Share it. Number 50. According to research carried out in 2013 by the World Economic Forum, Iceland could also be the world's friendliest nation. Specifically, Icelanders stated that they were happy to welcome foreign visitors to their country at a higher rate than anywhere else on Earth. Number 51. Iceland's capital and largest city by far is Reykjavik, on the southern shore of Faxafloy Bay. The city of Reykjavik has a population of just under 130,000 people, while the metropolitan area of Greater Reykjavik is home to roughly 230,000, meaning that just under two-thirds of the Icelandic population live in an area just over 1% of the total size of the country. Number 52. The Icelandic capital gets its name from the region's hot springs, as Reykjavik loosely translates to Smoke Cove. Early Icelanders apparently didn't know the difference between smoke and steam, and their foolish mistake has since been preserved forever in the title of their nation's capital, to their eternal shame. Number 53. Owing to Iceland's position in the North Atlantic, Reykjavik is the world's northernmost capital of a sovereign state. Greenland's capital of Nuuk is more north, but as Greenland is not a sovereign state but an autonomous territory within the Kingdom of Denmark, it loses out in the most northern capital city competition. Better luck next time, Nuuk. Number 54. 
Reykjavik is also the only capital city in the world home to colonies of puffins, and as such is sometimes referred to as the puffin capital of the world. Indeed, Iceland in general is home to 60% of the world's total puffin population, and as my grandma used to say, that's a lot of puffins. Number 55. In the year 2010, Icelandic stand-up comedian John Nahr thought it might be a lark to run for the position of mayor of Reykjavik, which he did mostly as a satirical dig to the political establishment who many blamed for the financial crisis in 2008. He ran on a number of sarcastic campaign promises, such as free access to swimming pools for everyone, a Disneyland in the capital airport, and to stop corruption by openly participating in it, while also promising to break all his campaign promises if elected. Amazingly, Nahr ended up winning the mayoral election, and did indeed break many of his promises. Number 56. Iceland sits atop the upper section of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Earth's longest mountain range that stretches from the Arctic Ocean all the way down under the Atlantic Ocean to well past the southern tip of Africa. The upper section of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge forms a boundary between the Eurasian and North American tectonic plates, which is why Iceland is so volcanically active and constantly spewing out lava and ash and poisonous gases like it's going out of style. Which I hear it is. Number 57. As such, the island of Iceland is split across the Eurasian and North American tectonic plates, and the previously mentioned valley of Thingvellir, where the first All Thing was convened, is one of only two places on Earth where a mid-ocean ridge can be seen on land, the other being the Afar Triangle in Africa. Number 58. The plates at Thingvellir are moving apart at the lightning pace of around 2 centimeters a year, so do be careful with your step if you're ever mad enough to visit. Number 59. The main island of Iceland covers an area of almost 102,000 square kilometres, making it the world's 18th largest island, and Europe's second largest island after Great Britain. Including Iceland's other smaller islands, the entire country measures up at a slightly larger 103,000 square kilometres, a little smaller than the US state of Ohio. Number 60. It's worth noting that Iceland only has a population of just over 360,000 people. Factoring in Iceland's area of 103,000 square kilometres, that makes Iceland the most sparsely populated nation in Europe, with less than three inhabitants per square kilometre. Approximately 90% of the Icelandic population lives on the coast. Number 61. The entirety of mainland Iceland lies just south of the Arctic Circle. However, the island of Grimsey, situated about 40 kilometres off the north coast of the mainland, currently lies right on the boundary with the northern tip of the island poking into the arctic like a finger in a pie. Which you shouldn't do, don't finger pies, guys. Number 62. Despite the fact that Iceland stands with its nose pressed up against the windows of the Arctic Circle, the island actually enjoys a relatively mild temperate climate, due to a little thing known as the Gulf Stream, a warm current without which Iceland would be much colder and probably uninhabitable. As such, Iceland's average winter temperature is 2 degrees Celsius. For America, that's 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Number 63. As has been made abundantly clear several times already in this video, Iceland is volcanically and geologically active. There are as many as 130 volcanic mountains in the country, of which around 30 are still very active indeed. Numerous others could easily awaken from their slumber and become active as the island changes and grows. Nintendo 64. Indeed, Iceland experiences a significant volcanic eruption roughly every three to four years. It's like their Olympics, only it's really not at all. Not even slightly, really. I don't know why I said it. Silly me. Ow. Number 65. As you are likely aware, Iceland is known around the world for the bold and striking beauty of its harsh environment. The interior regions of the island consist of a plateau characterised by moody lava fields, dramatic mountains and stunning glaciers. Of the island's total land area, about 62.7% is tundra, while only 23% is vegetated. Number 66. Iceland is also home to Vatna Jökull, the largest glacier in Europe. Indeed, the glacier is actually larger than all other glaciers in Europe combined, so suck on that rest of Europe. Number 67. Vatna Jökull lends its name to Vatna Jökull National Park, which includes the entirety of the aforementioned glacier and the extensive surrounding areas. This park also includes the incredibly difficult to pronounce, oh, uh, okay, okay, Kvanadalsnukor, the highest peak in Iceland, which measures up at 2,110 metres tall. Number 68. Ice is also known for its distinct lack of trees, which you can probably imagine is because humans showed up and started chopping them all down. When the Vikings arrived in Iceland and started setting up shop over 1,100 years ago, forests covered somewhere between 25 and 40% of the island. Today, despite considerable reforestation efforts, that figure is down to less than 2%. Number 69. Ice, ice, baby. Predictably, Iceland's harsh climate and geography limits the extent of its plant and animal wildlife. Indeed, the adorable little arctic fox is the only mammal that's native to the island. Number 70. Not only that, Iceland is apparently the only country on Earth with virtually zero mosquitoes, which for me personally is definitely a massive plus. Mosquitoes can do one. Number 71. 
Iceland is home to the Icelandic horse, a special breed that was developed for animals brought over from Iceland during the nation's settlement in the 9th and 10th centuries. Aside from being slightly smaller on average than many other horse breeds, Icelandic horses also display two additional gates as compared to other equine varieties, known as Tolt and Skeo, which I'm sure is impressive to people who know a lot about horses. Number 72. Iceland is so strict about the purity of its horses that once an Icelandic horse leaves Iceland, it can never be brought back. Bit harsh, but hey. <laughs> Get it? Hey, because that's what horses are. Oh, never mind. It's wasted on you. Number 73. The Icelandic language is most closely related to Faroese and Western Norwegian dialects, though it's not mutually intelligible with these languages in the same way that Norwegian, Swedish and Danish are with each other. Icelandic is also far more linguistically conservative than many other Western European languages. That means it's changed relatively little since developing from Old Norse. As a result, Icelandic speakers are generally able to read classic Old Norse literature written around a thousand years ago with relative ease. Number 74. Icelandic is also unique in that it's the only living language to retain the use of this runic letter, known as the letter Thorn. You can find it in the Latin script. Number 75. The word geyser is one of the few words in English that derives from Icelandic, originating from the name of a geyser called Geysir, located in Hukadala in southwestern Iceland. The name Geysir itself comes from Icelandic verb geyser, which means to gush. Ha <laughs> ha, gross. Number 76. Strangely for a Western nation, the vast majority of Icelanders do not have a family surname. Instead, surnames in Iceland are usually patronymic, formed by fusing the first name of one's father with the word son or datir, depending on the individual's gender. Matronymic names, formed in the same way but using the mother's name rather than the father's, are less common but occasionally used. What do you reckon though? Would you like to change your surname like this? Or do you like what you got already? Let us know in our snazzy YouTube poll. Go on, you can do it. Number 77. Probably as a result of its unique linguistic heritage, Iceland retains strict laws on what names parents can give to their children, in order to preserve the purity of the Icelandic language. There's even an organisation known as the Icelandic Naming Committee, which maintains an official register of approved Icelandic first names, and either approves or rejects the introduction of new ones into Icelandic culture. Number 78. Iceland's traditional cuisine includes the likes of whale, dried fish, roast sheep's head, and even pickled ram's testicles. Nice. One of Iceland's most well-known and perhaps infamous dishes is hakal, which is the meat of the Greenlandic shark that's been fermented and hung up to dry for several months. Hakal is processed in this way because the fresh meat of the Greenlandic shark is extremely poisonous. Maybe you shouldn't eat it then? This is owing to its high concentrations of uric acid and trimethylamine oxide, which serve as a natural antifreeze to protect the animal from becoming a shark popsicle in its frigid habitat. Hmm, sounds vaguely edible. I guess. Number 79. I feel as though I would be remiss in my duties as the voice of 101 Facts were I not to mention that Hakal was once described by the late great celebrity chef Anthony Boudin as the single worst, most disgusting, and terrible tasting thing he had ever eaten. Number 80. Another one of Iceland's delicacies is raw puffin heart. <sighs> yeah, okay, I'm just gonna move on. <laughs> Number 81. To be fair, the extent to which the average Icelander regularly chows down on bird hearts, toxic shark, and a nice ripe ram nut is likely to be somewhat overstated. Indeed, one of the most popular foods in Iceland is, somewhat unexpectedly, hot dogs. Icelandic hot dogs differ in that they are usually made from lamb, and are often served with a brown mustard called this, as well as remoulade, a sauce made with mayo, capers, mustard, and herbs. Number 82. In Iceland, there is a traditional bread, known as Rubraro, that's traditionally baked by burying it in the ground near a hot spring. Number 83. Shockingly, shockingly I say, beer was illegal in Iceland until 1989. Beer had been banned in Iceland throughout much of the 20th century, in part due to temperance movement, similar to those seen in other countries, which sought to restrict the consumption of beer on moral grounds. Additionally, beer was often associated with Denmark, and as such was often thought of as unpatriotic during the country's movement towards independence. Number 84. Iceland boasts the highest consumption of Coca-Cola per capita in any country on Earth, once again as a result of its low population that makes per capita record setting much, much easier. Damn it, Iceland. Damn it! Number 85. Iceland's national sport is handball, a quirky little pastime popular throughout the Nordic nations as well as Germany, France and Spain. Handball is sort of similar to football, or soccer, but while handball is an illegal move in football, in handball, handball is the name of the sport handball. Have you got it? There you go. There's some facts about handball. Number 86. Another of Iceland's popular sports is known as glimmer, a form of Nordic folk wrestling that originated in Iceland way back in the 14th century. The most common form of glimmer is known as brokotok or trouser grip, which originally had competitors attempt to throw their opponent to the ground by grabbing onto their trousers, a practice that's widely frowned upon in most sensible societies. Nowadays, trouser yanking has been replaced with the use of special belts, which provide various gripping points for the wrestlers without the risk of having a pants pulled down. Number 87. 
In its 80-year history of participation in the Olympics, Iceland has won a grand total of four medals. A bronze in judo, a bronze and a silver in athletics, and a silver in handball. Zero gold, though. And also, Iceland has never won a medal at the Winter Olympics. But I think their time's coming up, baby. Number 88. One of Iceland's most popular and well-known attractions is the Blue Lagoon, a geothermal spa located in lava field near the town of Grindavik. You may be shocked to learn that unlike many of the other spas located throughout Iceland, the Blue Lagoon is actually man-made, and its soothing waters are technically the waste product of the nearby geothermal power plant. Ew. Okay. Number 89. The Blue Lagoon gets its characteristic milky blue colour from the high levels of silica, which forms a rich mud at the bottom of the pool that's apparently good for your skin. I should point out though that's not true of all mud. Had to learn that the hard way. Number 90. Wonderfully, joyously, and fabulously, Iceland's capital of Reykjavik is home to what one can only assume is one of the world's most thrilling centres of education, the Icelandic Phallological Museum. For those of you not savvy to the meaning of the word phallological, allow me to illuminate. It means the study of dongs. Yes, the sleepy town of Reykjavik is the location of a museum dedicated to Wang, which contains the world's largest collection of pork swords, numbering at over 215 specimens from a wide variety of species, including whales, polar bears, seals, walruses, dogs, cats, goats, hamsters, and yes, even a human. Number 91. Apparently, around 60% of visitors to the Icelandic Phallological Museum, which I hasten to remind you is a museum dedicated to, you know, are women. What you do with that information is between you and your god, frankly. Number 92. Hilariously, Iceland has such a small population that in 2013, a group of Icelandic software developers created an app that allows frisky Icelanders to check an online genealogical database in order to make sure that any potential partners are not too closely related to them. Yes, that's right. A way to avoid an accidental Game of Thrones scenario. Number 93. Iceland publishes more books per capita than any other country on the planet. Not only that, roughly 1 in 10 Icelanders will publish a book in their lifetime. Number 94. Books are so important in Icelandic culture that it's even part of Christmas celebrations, as most new books are typically published towards the end of the year. This is known in Iceland as the Jólabókafloth, which literally translates to the Christmas book flood. Books are traditionally exchanged on Christmas Eve, and you spend the rest of the night reading. Number 95. Iceland is one of the few nations on Earth without a single McDonald's, despite the fact that it has KFC and even a Taco Bell. Weirdly enough, Iceland did used to have a McDonald's in its capital of Reykjavik. But owing to the financial crisis, as well as the Icelandic loyalty to their own native burger chain, Hamburgara Bulan, the nation's only Golden Arches closed in 2008. Number 96. Apparently, 54% of Icelanders state that they either believe in elves, or believe it's possible that elves exist. Belief in elves is so common it sometimes affects government work, with planned roads being redirected to avoid oh, supposed elf ahead. habitats. Uh, yeah, I sure hope it does. Iceland even has an official elf school in Reykjavik, where people can learn about Icelandic elf history and folklore. Number 97. Following the financial crisis in 2008, constitutional reforms were initiated in Iceland that included allowing the nation's public to make suggestions and alterations via Facky book. As a result, the draft constitution was widely referred to as the world's first crowdsourced constitution. Number 98. Iceland's oldest and largest higher education institution is the University of Iceland, founded in 1911 in the nation's capital of Reykjavik. The university had earned itself a place in this delightful video you're watching because of the haunting statue that stands outside its main building, which appears to depict a man attacking a seal with a Bible. Rude. The man in question is Seyman Deer Fruig, an Icelandic scholar born in the 11th century, while the seal is actually the devil, who he's beating in order to get out of handing over his soul after agreeing to exchange it for a ride home to Iceland. Number 99. Babies in Iceland are often left outside to nap, even in sub-zero of temperatures, based on the general belief that cold, fresh air strengthens the immune system. It's not particularly uncommon for parents to leave their infants outside while they sit drinking coffee in their local cafe. Number 100. In 2010, Iceland banned strip clubs, constituting the first such ban in a Western democratic country. The ban on strip clubs in Iceland was regarded as a win for women's rights by feminist groups, while I'm sure some people, not myself included, because I don't live in Iceland, were very, very sad. Number 101. Iceland has no public railway system of any kind, making the pastime of train spotting in the country especially difficult. Good luck, gang. So that was 101 Facts About Iceland. Have you ever been to Iceland? Do you live in Iceland? Let me know in the comments down below. Be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to 101 Facts if you haven't done so already. All the cool kids have. And at this point, you're just missing out. Also, tell us what you want to see next. In the meantime, though, look at these two videos on screen now. One of them has been cooked up especially for you. Why not click on one of these and see which one it is? I'll even mention your name in it, maybe. Like now. I'll mention your name now, like if it's John or Karen or something. I might do that same thing in the end board for another video. Who knows? See you there. Bye.